Welcome to the Middle East Institute. Uh, many of you have been here before, familiar faces. We're always delighted to have you back. Uh, as you know, we have programs that stretch from North Africa to Afghanistan and Pakistan. And we always remind people of the fact that the Middle East Institute, which was founded in 1946, defined the Middle East initially as including Afghanistan and Pakistan. So we haven't come lately to the idea that this is one region uh, for many, many of the things that, that now confront the United States and, uh, and elsewhere. It was about a little more than a year ago that a uh, gentleman stood up here and spoke very forthrightly about the situation in Pakistan. And of course, that man was Salman Tassir. And it's because of the brutal death of Salman Tassir, indeed followed by another murder, Mr. Bhatti, who represented the minority community, Salman Bashir at the time, of course, the provincial governor of the Punjab province. Uh, both of those men stood out because uh, they were among the relative few at this point in time who were willing to speak out in a forthright way about the rights of minorities and especially the uh, oppressive blasphemy laws and other, other measures which have kept Pakistan from really realizing so many of its own aspirations. Well, Salman Tassir is, is not with us, uh, but he has, he has a courageous daughter in Shabanu Tassir, who is with us today. Uh, and she has been speaking out, as her father would want her to, I'm sure, speaking out, uh, keeping that, that flame here uh, alive because so many in the wake of those two assassinations, uh, stepped back and were prepared to, to uh, uh, find cover, including, including the leadership of Salman Bashir's, uh, Tassir's own, own political party. But some others, like Shabanu, have been stepping forward, have been addressing the issues that her father and others have uh, tried to, to, bring, to bring, uh, bring about a more progressive Pakistan. And so we're, we're pleased that she's visiting here in the States. She's uh, a journalist by profession, working for uh, Newsweek Pakistan. Uh, if you're not familiar with that publication, it is a, an offshoot of our own Newsweek uh, and is a, developing very quickly an excellent reputation. And uh, Shabanu is one of its, its journalists. Uh, she's been speaking out uh, regularly now in the media throughout, covered uh, throughout uh, uh, the Western world and also, I believe, uh, uh, the Arab media as well. So uh, she's become, in her own right, a well-known spokesperson. Uh, and we're delighted that she found time to join us here uh, this afternoon. Please. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. It's an honor to be speaking at the Middle East Institute today, um, an organization whose work I follow and greatly admire. And um, I, have, I have fond memories of the MEI. The last time that I was here was a year ago to accompany my father, Salman Tassi, who spoke about the challenges that Pakistan faces, and of course, our incredible accomplishments over the years. So the reason that, that brings me back here, uh, just one short year later, is, is ironic and, and tragic. And I do wish that it could have been under different circumstances that I was speaking here today. I'm here today to, to share my story with all of you. Um, it's a story that begins in November of last year when a poor and illiterate Christian woman named Asya Noreen was sentenced to death for allegedly committing blasphemy in a tiny village outside my hometown, Lahore. 
Pakistan's cruel blasphemy laws were institutionalized during the draconian dictatorship of General Zia al-Haq in 1986. Zia's dictatorship was one of the harshest in Pakistan's history and, and possibly in the history of the world. We had thought that the nightmare and the brutality of Zia's regime would be over when his plane plummeted to the ground in 1988 and he was killed. But we were so wrong because it's thriving in full, in full form today and it's come back to haunt us. One of the many tokens that Zia left behind was Pakistan's cruel blasphemy laws. Um, these laws are criminally vague and open-ended. They prohibit the damaging or defiling of a place of worship, sacred object or holy text, and they, um, they forbid the defaming of the Prophet Muhammad and Islam, whatever that may mean. So when my father heard about Asya Noreen's case, um, he, was, he was the governor of Punjab at the time and he was a businessman. But before all of that, he was a humanitarian. And um, so he, he felt very strongly about this case and it, it spoke to his heart. So he went to visit Asya in jail to get um, her, her thumb impression on a mercy petition seeking pardon from our president, Asif Ali Zadari. Since that fateful day, Asya became a lightning rod, arousing fervid sentiment across a very polarized Pakistan. My father held a press conference when he went to visit her, and he gave many interviews in which he maintained that this woman, like the 2,700 before her, had most likely been unfairly accused of blasphemy. Um, he called for a moderate, inclusive, and tolerant Pakistan. And you know, he, he reminded the public that Pakistan's flag is green and white, and the white is there to, to represent the minorities. But every day, these minorities are being butchered, threatened, marginalized, and terrorized because of these blasphemy laws. So soon after he made these comments, the religious right flared up. They lack legitimacy because they've never managed to get more than 10% of the popular vote. But they have a disproportionate amount of street power. They're, they're loud, they're well-armed, they're well-funded. Uh, we can thank our Saudi brothers for that. Um, and they're well-organized, and they're lusting for power. So they protested and they burnt my father in effigy and they issued religious edicts against him. But their biggest crime was that they made something that was about humanity into something about religion. My, they twisted my father's views to suit their own incendiary narrative. My, my father had stood up for a voiceless, forgotten woman who had been languishing in jail for over a year. And for this, he was declared a blasphemer and marked for violence. Um, it seems that times are such that if you are willing to believe in something in Pakistan, you have to be willing to die for, to die for it. Because on January 4th, 2011, my brother Shayar's 25th birthday, a member of my father's security team, Mumtaz Qadri, casually strolled up behind him and, and shot him 27 times until he died. In the days that, that followed the murder, I was left reeling. I felt like I had been plucked out of what was a relatively normal and ordinary life and was being made to live out some surreal nightmare. Um, scared out of their wits, cleric after cleric refused to lead my father's funeral prayer. And the, the lone ranger who did has now had to go into hiding after receiving multiple de death threats. Um, at Mumtaz Qadri's first court appearance, 200 lawyers garlanded him and showered him with rose petals for killing my father, the blasphemer. Um, it took us. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly open and shut case, but it took us a month and a half to find a lawyer, a prosecutor, and a judge who would be willing to take on this case. And Muntaz Qadri, on the other hand, was offered pro bono services by the head of the Rawalpindi Bar Association. Um, a rally of, of 35,000 rabid clerics took to the streets in Karachi a month after my father's murder in support of this blasphemy law and in support of um, what had happened. 